all yours. Okay, thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction, and also thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, this is much, much bigger than any of the lectures that I do at, uh, at Meiji University, uh, where I've had uh, very, um, uh, very interesting uh, experiences um, for the last uh, five years. So uh, I'm based in Tokyo. Um, I work. I teach uh, anime and manga uh, related courses at the university, among other things. Um, but uh, it's always uh, really a pleasure to interact with the audience. So if you feel that uh, you know I'm pointing at you, and so, so, so don't feel too threatened. You know, uh, I'm on your side. Okay. Uh, right. So uh, thank you uh, also to Anime Expo, uh, the organizers, for uh, being very kind to us. Um, you know, they were here helping us with the technical stuff. Um, I don't want to take too much more time. Um, I'm, uh, I'm already probably pushing it a little bit. So uh, if I feel like I'm rushing a little bit, then please ask me questions uh, at the end or maybe afterwards. I'll be around. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's go. So my introduction um, is uh, basically let's begin at the very beginning. Uh, what is anime when we when we get down to the nitty gritty of it? Uh, and let's go see past this cool uh, big eyes style kind of cartoons or anything. It, what is it in terms of uh, the, the economic side, the cultural side, the social side? How is it consumed? Um, is it a product? Is it an art form? Or is it a medium through which to sell products? Well, I'll give you the easy answer. It's all three. Uh, thank you very much. You can leave now. <laughs> I'll give you the details if you want to stick around. Um, the reason I ask this question first is because uh, I, like you, most of you, I assume, uh, I'm a hardcore anime fan. I was since I uh, was born and raised in Peru until seven years old, and then I moved over to the UK, uh, where I had a major culture shock because no one cared about cartoons uh, in the 1990s. No one. And, uh, and I always was uh, very intrigued by different societies uh, being susceptible to certain stimulus um, Within, within media. And uh, of course now you have the internet, so that's mostly irrelevant. Uh, but, but these kind of questions uh, started popping up. And so, oops. Um, I've uh, kind of been beaten to the punch in my research by a couple of gentlemen. Um, these couple of books came out in the last uh, few years, uh, oh, very recent. Um, the first one here on the left is Mark Steinberg's and the Media Mix. Uh, the one on the right is uh, Ian Condry's uh, the soul of anime. I think there were both speakers here on planet Earth. Right? So yeah. Mr. Condry was the keynote speaker at the inaugural you know, symposium in 2011, and Ian Steinberg was the keynote speaker Fine. last year. So hopefully, I don't. Did any of you get a chance to see either of their presentations? Okay. Well, this is probably going to build up upon that. Uh, yeah, Mark Steinberg, uh, I have, unfortunately haven't met yet, uh, but Ian Condry, I met him uh, in Tokyo a couple of weeks ago and had a conversation about this. Um, Basically, to sum it up, uh, I would say that uh, the book on the right, Anime Media Mix, is um, basically talking about anime as if it was an intricate merchandising infrastructure, which it is. That's true. Um, the soul of anime talks about collaborative creativity communities. You know, it takes a lot of people, and they have to be on the same wavelength uh, to make anime. Which it does. So these are very well researched books, and I'm not trying to knock them. The, the, you know, the, uh, there are. Uh, you, I recommend them to everybody. I just want to add something to this because I felt that perhaps there's a bit of a discrepancy here. I don't think these two things always uh, necessarily go together. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean. Um, when I came to Japan the first time in 1998, uh, you know, hardcore anime fan went to. Uh, you know, Tokyo and Akira, and I went to uh, Osaka and all these places, and I thought, ah, oh, yes, this is a land of anime. Ah. And, but you know what? It's not. Actually, most people don't care. They just don't care. They yeah, turn on TV, and anime is not on 24 hours a day, as I thought it was. So uh, I, I went over, I said, do you have uh, volume 14 of Microsoft 7? I want it. And uh, you know, the shopkeepers are looking at me going, what, 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 what? So you know, I, I'm starting to think about maybe Anime is a subculture everywhere in the world. Uh, well, uh, this led me down the path of research, and I, I was more intrigued. More than the content of the anime, I was uh, intrigued 
why this was. And if you look at the makeup of Japanese society, you can see here on the left, there is the typical uh, ideal population pyramid, right? You have a very, very small uh, proportion of elderly people and a lot of young people, right? This is a very, very um, good society to be living, a thriving uh, young culture. Uh, in the middle, you've got Japan in the 1970s. Here you can see the baby boomers that started coming up after the war are now entering adult age or adolescence, right? This is really where we start getting uh, things like counterculture. And it happens over here too, it happens all over the world in the developed countries. Um, in 1985, something interesting happened that the second baby boomer generation was reaching maturity too. This is all very relevant when you actually look at the content and uh, the way that anime is sold in each of these three periods of time. Well, maybe not the 50s, but... <laughs> um, we can plot uh, major happenings in the popular culture and industries uh, around these periods. Tezuka, Sinta Garajima. Everyone heard of that? That's, that's like the, the first lesson in my manga, manga lesson book. Um, this is when Akahon manga was really, uh, it, it broke free of its boundaries. Uh, this book sold 400,000 copies and made a star of Tezuka Osan overnight, right? The people who were raised on this newfound manga industry then had kids of their own. And the next generation had a similar revolution. <laughs> Sounds strange. Uh, a similar revolution. Um, for example, in the shoujo manga world, there was something called the Year 24 group. And I'm talking about um, you know, Takaniya Keiko and uh, Ryoko Ikeda, people like that, uh, who did Rose of Versailles, all these things. And then, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, you had the anime boom, so-called anime boom. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. But, so what do we mean by the first baby boomer generation? Well, rock and roll, Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, all these guys, they rocked your world, right? There was nothing like youth culture before, really. Now, uh, you were living in a very, very affluent society and things were getting much, much better, uh, much better, you were getting more spending power, you were getting lots of popular culture, and of course, this all developed into counter culture, where the younger generations were really like, oh, we don't care what our parents say, we're gonna go out on the beach, we're gonna have sex, we're gonna start, you know, vandalizing some stuff. And of course, this happened everywhere in the world, Japan was no exception, certainly, I mean, they, they appear very reserved from our perspective, but they were not, uh, at least not this generation. Taiyo no Kisetsu, the season of the sun, was a very, <clears throat> very, very uh, risque, uh, thing. And of course, it gave rise to a dozen subcultures and more. Uh, Rockabilly, Harajuku, Anhanzoku, Nom Nomzoku, Takenobuzoku. So, uh, you know, I'll give you a testament to everyone. Uh, Atokizoku was one of them that came up uh, later on. You can see still uh, remnants of this if you go around Harajuku. Um, but the point is that, you know, it, they could do this because they had the numbers. Baby boomers means that they are now the majority in society. And so this is Kyoto University, where I did my postgrad research. I never saw it look like this. This building is on fire, man. <laughs> look at those guys. There's hundreds and thousands of people there, revolting. And, uh, you know, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about what they were revolting against, but this is a cultural revolution that, you know, sticks, it makes, it makes changes. Now, <clears throat> once you have made a cultural revolution and you have established a manga industry, for example, where anything goes and it's become mainstream, it doesn't matter how progressive, how liberal you were, you are now a conservative because you shed a lot of blood, sweat and tears to keep it that way. So, Shintaro Ishihara, who became the um, uh, governor of Tokyo, you know, he wrote uh, Taiyo no Kisetsu, that tale about delinquents that inspired the generation. Now he's saying, no, we should, uh, we should not have manga and anime be too erotic. We should not have it be too violent because it's bad for kids. Actually, I just don't like it. 
And, and you know, it, it affects um, Tokyo ordinance laws, and it affects the publishing industry. And in other words, it affects the content that you guys uh, and, and me enjoy. Right? So let's go back to this. Um, I said that there's a second anime boom. This pointer isn't working. Uh, there's a second anime boom here in Berlin uh, at the bottom. Uh, that's because these guys, the first anime boom, of course, had lots of kids as well. They got money. Everything's improving, the bubble economy. So they're going to have lots of kids. But um, they, it doesn't matter if they are another baby boomer generation, they can't really form another revolution. Because the mainstream is always going to be the majority now. Uh, so, you've got a gap. <laughs> and this is the gap that we're going to be talking about, or referring to rather, uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, very, very few people in the West, in, in the Western, uh, in the English language uh, research that I have read, make references to the late 70s, early 80s anime boom. Uh, and I, I think that more needs to be said about this, because it is a revolution within this subculture. Maybe it didn't affect uh, the mainstream culture as a whole, and anime remains a subculture, but it is extremely important. Uh, let's take a look at what was happening before this. In the 1960s, TV anime sponsors. Sponsors are going to be the key here. Sponsors and their relationship to the TV anime producers. They mostly made up, um, were made up of food and confectionery uh, companies, like Meiji Seika, you know, Calpis, things like that. Um, but in the 1970s, uh, you know, Cal Calpis is still, uh, house foods, they still sponsored uh, some anime, like Heidi. Uh, but, uh, but it was really when uh, the toy companies took over, and it was a major paradigm shift. Who put this system into motion? Well, it was that guy again. Sezuka <laughs> Osami. Look at him, sitting on his almost little gold mine. <laughs> um, he made the first animated TV show. There were movies, of course, by uh, Toei before. Uh, but he set in stone, basically, the system through which uh, anime was going to be produced on the cheap and uh, also monetized. Right? Because you can't sell movie tickets to a TV show. So, uh, I'm going to go through all the details, I don't really have time. But, uh, let me know, it was him. Uh, <laughs> so, he used a lot of cost-cutting techniques, which animators then took advantage of by uh, making it more cinema-like. Right? And if you've ever watched uh, early anime, then I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and compared it to things like the Flintstones and the Jets. Um, so, limited animation. Uh, here's the key point, right? It doesn't matter how many cost-cutting techniques Tezuka put forward, he still undersold the show. He really wanted this stuff on the air, and, uh, what is it? 555,000 uh, yen for 30 minutes is really not going to cover all the costs, because animation is manpower. It still is! Hand-drawn. Uh, so, this was a blessing and a curse, because it set a precedent. He was the first one to do it. So, there's no one else who's going to enter the market and a competitor and then charge more. Why did he charge less? Well, it was a, uh, a combination of factors. Number one, right there, he's sitting on the gold mine. What does that mean? Most of his anime was based on most of his characters that he had already sold and popularized. Uh, so, you know, Atom, yes, we know Atom, we want to see him move. Doesn't matter if the show's garbage, we want to tune in and watch it. So, he's already got that in the bag. Uh, an original anime show um, probably, you know, didn't have that, uh, had, had a more of a risk factor. So, let's go back. How is anime made? Uh, well, in some of my lessons, I sometimes take uh, students to animation studios, and so, you know, you can actually go up and just take stuff. No, I don't think you can just take stuff. Uh, but, uh, but you can take a look at uh, how, um, you know, people draw the cells, and people, not the cells, but the, the Genga and the Hanga and the uh, Dolga and things like that. And uh, these are some of my Japanese students. Uh, I teach Japanese students and also uh, foreign students in Japanese and English. Um, I thought it was important because a lot of Japanese people also don't know how anime is made. You know, as I said, it's not mainstream. People don't talk about it. Uh, so this is Art of the Corporation. Are there any uh, Yamato or Macros or Legend of Galactic uh, Heroes fans Woo! here? Uh, 
there is a, in the middle there is uh, Ishiguro Noboru, who unfortunately passed away a couple years ago. Um, but he's there chilling out, relaxing. Um, yeah, I mean, and look at these uh, desks here. They haven't really changed since the time of Tezuka. In many cases, they're the same desks that they've been using for five decades. It's kind of amazing. Um, so the animation business model uh, was basically that someone, some young spark, had discovered that if you have an animation, even if it's just a 30 minute commercial, uh, you can sell your product far more than if you didn't have an animation to go with it. So, uh, 30 minute commercials, I mean, I'm sure you've heard that uh, in the context of like Transformers and Mars <coughs> and you know, Thundercats and stuff like that. Uh, it was always like that in Japan. Let that be 100% clear. It was always 30 minute commercials. Uh, animated series could be used as advertising. So, Tezuka, by understanding the show, uh, was doing two things. He was doing the marketing tie ups so that the sponsor was happy and could sell their sweets or whatever they wanted to sell. Um, he was also licensing uh, his intellectual property so that people could recognize his character in a multitude of products and then would go back to his character. Right? Uh, as far as more cost cutting techniques, it would be Fordism. Right? You could get this assembly line. Uh, production system, uh, and within that, the animators who were at the bottom and were often freelance were being paid 100,000 yen per month, and that hasn't changed that much because NHK, did, you know, it was all over the uh, the Twitter sphere, the blogosphere, sphere, the Facebook sphere, um, a couple of months ago. That uh, you know, animators are majorly underpaid, and like, we know it. That's why, yeah, it's inhuman. Call it whatever you want, but that's why it works. That's why you can get animation. Um, so, in effect, you're working for the love of the craft, right? If you want to make money, you can do anything else. Clean the toilet at McDonald's, you'll earn more. Uh, so anyway, these are the kind of products that they used to have. Um, pe <clears throat> people would collect these uh, stickers and trade them. Um, not really toys, right? Uh, these stickers would come with the sweets. Uh, this is all Atom. Uh, this is Gigantor, uh, Iron Man 28, Tetsuji Mihachu. Uh, until a hot sky set comes along. So, Little Witch Sally. Sally the Witch. Uh, this is very, very important because she is the first uh, Maho Shoujo. She is the first Majoko, um, which, of course, you know, begins a tradition that continues to this day. Uh, this was the first toy company to sponsor. Uh, the theme of Witches and Magical Girls was actually uh, something that came from Bewitched. It was very popular in Japan. And they still rerun it. Yeah, sometimes I turn on the TV in the morning. It's there, yeah. Um, so, Magazine of Show was uh, really, if you go back and uh, do the research, was the first uh, company, uh, toy company, that sponsored animation programs. Right? That's the, that's the uh, magical thing that uh, if you bought like a good little girl, if you bought your compact mirror, you can change into anything you wanted. <laughs> Except, of course, if you bought your little mirror, you do the thing, take a look at the and nothing happens. Because there's no such thing as magic, boys and girls. So, there's a lot of things, you know, a lot of people are traumatized, I imagine. But, uh, but, no way, it gets better. Um, th well, this basically started a whole tradition, um, and, you know, this was, uh, a toy company's dream that every year they would have a new character, a new show, and you know, you just change the previous year's model, and it would be a new item that you know the stupid kid would buy. It would be fine, no problem. And even, right? Uh, yeah, right? Uh, okay, now, let me, let, let me point one thing out. Anika Naika was not made to sell these things. <laughs> right? That's right. Right. So that means that something happened at one point in history. Uh, this was the norm for a while, and then something happened. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we've got giant robots. Why have we got giant robots? Like who? Literally, who would ever pilot a giant robot? It is not <laughs> functional at all, right? <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> I hate giant robots. Yes, we all do. <laughs> But it's the same thing, right? Uh, Poppy, a uh, subsidiary of Bandai, said, all right, every year we're going to have a new uh, robot. Uh, okay, so you guys uh, make the show for us. We want this robot that's going to shoot fists. 
uh, have the fist shooting robot and, uh, and, and then we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, obviously, Mazinger was based on Godagai, uh, Godagai's creation and they made the toy afterwards. Um, but they, you know, they realized, hey, we're onto something here. And so Poppy said, all right, now we've got this toy, right? And we wanted to transform to burp, right? So uh, do whatever you have to do so that uh, parents, you know, uh, go over and, uh, and buy, buy stuff. Uh, okay, so then the creators would be like, well, I guess maybe maybe there's a mystical backstory of why, and Poppy's like, yeah, whatever, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. So then toy companies, for a while, called shots. Uh, they said what robot, what item, what features it would have, everything. Uh, and then the anime production studios were basically left to put it all together. Uh, so, 1970s, it was all that. All throughout the 1970s, uh, it was all that. But you notice that the shows were becoming more and more complex. The designs were becoming more and more complex. The toys were becoming more and more complex. This is a direct result of the bubble economy, plus the, uh, and the second uh, baby boomer generation growing up. Right? They were not letting go of uh, you know, old habits of time art, right? They were not letting go of their childhood uh, things, and they were playing with more and more complicated toys, and uh, getting into more and more interesting uh, robot anime. And it all really culminates in like uh, Gundam and things like that. Uh, so this is therefore the rise of the anime fan, right? And then you get to this point in time, 1974. Uh, in case you're too young to remember, I am. I didn't exist either. <laughs> uh, there was no such thing as VHS, DVD, or uh, VHD. That's probably the um, Yamato and Heidi were on exactly the same time, on exactly the same day, on different times. So, what are you going to do? You can't watch them both. Um, they went directly head to head, and of course, you know, Yamato loses. Uh, but we know, it, we know there's a happy ending, right? It, yes, it did get cancelled, but only because of fan activities. The fan circles around Japan gathered, organized themselves, and wrote to Nishizaki, uh, the producer, and said, please, 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 bring it back, do something, we're gonna... And then he was like, all right then, well, let me see if I can gather enough funds, to see if we can, uh, we can get the revenue together, uh, and invest it into a movie version. And so, you know, that's how you got movie digest versions, um, which are all rage now. Um, and this coincided with the birth of the anime magazine. And I'm going to talk about this uh, in a second. But notice that the first anime magazines, all of them on the cover, had Yamato. Okay? Uh, we'll, we'll go into that in a minute. Yamato no wasa banashi wa ichiwan demo akinai. I can talk about Yamato all night. Those were the kind of articles that they had. It seems like a dojuji, and in many ways it was. Um, fans put together articles for these magazines at the very, very beginning. Uh, because editors didn't know, they didn't know about anime, they didn't care about anime, it was kid stuff, just sell toys, right? Uh, so, you've got this uh, generational gap starting to occur. Now, early 1980s, you've got the generation based on an uh, who, who were raised on anime, and they're starting to create their own anime too. Uh, they're uh, leaving high school, they're going into college, uh, and they're starting things like the comic market, right? Which is enormous now! Like, okay, uh, Anime Expo, this is my first time in Anime Expo, it's enormous, yes. Uh, but comic Ed is like four times as big, can you imagine that? Uh, you can visibly see the evaporated sweat. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very famous. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Oh, well, just once. And then you're, you're in the IT. Uh, so, so it's basically fans creating content, right? And there's something called uh, Studio Nue that starts to come around. And uh, Studio Nue is basically a design agency for sci-fi illustrations and things, and they were basically the go-to guys for the technical stuff. So, you know, I don't know if you remember uh, the end credits of Mazinger Z when, you know, you see the cutaway of, of Mazinger. So all of the, that internal mechanism stuff, that's all Studio Nue, right? Uh, you know, internal stuff there. Uh, and what are they basing their illustrations on? Stuff like this, right? Highline sci-fi covers. They're very, very inspired by Western science fiction. And uh, some of these translations uh, were coming out very, very quickly. And sometimes they would, uh, they would translate Russian science fiction into Japanese before they would translate them into English. I'm sure the Cold War has a lot to do with that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, so these are the Japanese covers 
for Starship Troopers and stuff, and you know, Studio Nui said, all right, we'll just base our own design of the powered suit from Starship Troopers and, uh, and put it on the cover. Uh, this was an extremely, extremely famous design uh, among these up-and-coming young otaku geek guys that they were able to render it almost perfectly in three dimensions with the rise of the garage kit industry. Again, still very, very much under the radar, a garage kit, literally people working out of their garage. Um, but, uh, but within this small niche, Studio Nui became very, very famous. So, when Studio Nui said something like, oh, we're gonna make our own anime now, <laughs> you know, parents didn't care, but, uh, and kids didn't know, but the otaku guys were like, oh my god, what are they going to do? We gotta watch this thing. And so, Macros, right? This is no longer now. Take a my phone, and I open the, the cabinet, uh, uh, and I, oh, I, don't, I don't change. I'm not a magical girl. I, 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 but this is Mac now. <laughs> because the robot transforms exactly the same as it does in the anime, as it does in your hand. Right? Uh, this was extremely revolutionary. And let's take a look at who worked on it. Right? There's a list of people, I'm not going to read them all out, but I'm sure you know, some guys over there, they probably don't read them. These were all anime otaku. They're fans who just happened to be in the right place at the right time. They literally knocked on the door of Studio Nui and they said, We love Yamato, um, please let us just hang around. When they were in high school, literally, they said, and, uh, and the staff at Studio Nui said, uh, Okay, um, you know, why don't you just draw some crap in the corner? <laughs> they turned around and they were like, Hey, you're pretty good! You don't work! They gave them jobs! It's the Dojin anime. Dojinshi culture was starting to come up and Dojinshi anime also existed. Um, so, when it came time to pitch a show and, say, uh, and go over to a toy company for a sponsor, because without a sponsor you don't have no show, uh, the, um, uh, the toy companies all said, uh, we, we don't want planes, um, we, 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 don't want, uh, we don't want anything that doesn't transform into a robot. We, we want robots, humanoid robots. And they were, of course, coming off these uh, Heinlein sci-fi sci hardcore stuff. And they said, no, we don't want, we don't want to do that. Uh, so there were a lot of concessions to make. But when they said we could do it really realistically, and Shoji Kamori uh, said, okay, I'll make my wooden prototype and show it to you. And he did his presentation. They said, okay, let's do it. Your show is on. I don't remember, I don't remember what the story is, but yes, we can sell this toy. So it was, again, the right time. Uh, you have to know that all of this is concurrent uh, with the idol boom, right? Um, Akina Nakamori and Seiko Matsuda, all these people were chart-topping um, you know, the hit. And so, not only is the toy realized in three dimensions, exactly the same way as it is on the screen, but also the music. You know, one of the main characters is a singer, and she has a record deal, and you are buying her records, listening to those songs as if you were in the show too. This is, uh, you know, the, basically the media mix, uh, the beyond the media mix even uh, that Mark Steinberg was talking about. Uh, but uh, but of course, you know, like I said, there were a lot of concessions to be made. Uh, Macros wasn't what the people were actually trying to make; it was something else. Um, but these concessions actually gave rise to more creativity in many ways. Um, so, with the rise of the anime fandom and anime fandom <coughs> industry, the needs of the sponsors gradually began to diverge with the wants of the production staff towards the mid-1980s. What do I mean by that? I mean that when I said, that they said, uh, okay, we're going to make the toy, the young staff of Takano, Takatoku Toys, who was the sponsor, said, yeah, that seems really cool, let's do it. The older staff was still like, yeah, I think kids want to play with spaceships. I don't think they like these aeroplane things. So it took the lower ranks to convince the upper uh, ranks to actually go forward with this project, really. As you probably know, uh, most companies in Japan, and Japanese society in general, is very, very hierarchical, based on age, mostly. Uh, so, you know, the higher up, the, the older you are, the higher up, by default, you are in the company. Um, so, this is very much the product of a generational gap, and there's a generational rift happening here, because now people are very, very interested in content, not so much in uh, peripherals and uh, merchandising. So, for the post dramatic gener generation, uh, fan movements, organization, uh, they were 
their own force. Right? They were moving forward. Anyone recognize this? Okay. Yeah. Back in three and four. Now, this they weren't telling anything. This was the opening animation to the sci-fi convention, right? This was the first, almost, I think, that I can find, uh, animation that was made for the love of the craft and nothing else, no profit whatsoever. Uh, so let's go back to Magical Girls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the hanger in the end. Um, Fairy Prince and Mickey Mon. Okay, uh, this is another revolution here. Uh, the same year as Macros. As revolutionary as Macros was for robots, Mickey Mon was also revolutionary for um, Magical Girls. Uh, it's the first non Toei, everything else has been produced by Toei, so uh, Toei didn't actually have a patent on the idea of Magical Girls. Um, but look who's working on it. Ashley Broke was famous for robots. Uh, look who's making the toys. Poppy? Yeah, what are they famous for? Magic Z, robots. So it's actually very, very strange. Um, and, uh, and it introduced typical tropes such as the little animal friends and stuff like that. And, uh, okay, uh, this is <laughs> this is something I, I I bought the other day with with you. <laughs> uh, so um, you know it's it, it's mecha. It's a mecha anime. It doesn't look like a mecha anime. But uh, you know she gets into a little car and then it combines with a trailer and then you can fly all over the world. <laughs> you know, what is it? Whose idea is this? Obviously not the producers. Was toy companies. They're like, yeah, make a flying machine. <laughs> and I'm like, well, how do we get. Oh, all right. And then when they do that, they realize, hey, yeah, we should have a flying machine because now we can set any episode in any country. And we can go to the jungle and then we can have a, an episode in a volcano or whatever, you know. So uh, they really, really uh, saw this as an opportunistic restriction. Uh, and Japanese popular culture is full of these. You know, that we've got to make it this way. But yeah, let's, let's have fun with this. Let's take advantage of these constrictions and restrictions. Um, so, they're actually sometimes helpful to explore creative freedom. Um, but, that's not to say that they're still not at the mercy of the sponsors and they can pull the plug whenever they want. So, for the first eight episodes or so, they said, okay, let's make an orthodox magical girl show. She does some good stuff and she saves a day and everyone loves her. All right. And then after episode eight, you start to see, I'm not going to spoil the whole series, but you start to see, this is actually a completely different show. And these uh, people working on this show are lovers of animation. They just love animation. Um, so, you know, the uh, magical flying car apparently didn't sell very well, and uh, so Poppy lost interest. They say, okay, we're going back to robots. This girl thing is not working out. Um, <laughs> so, Mickey Momo actually faced cancellation after 46 episodes. 46 is going to be your last one. Uh, we had a good ride, thank you very much. And the writers were furious. They're like, well, what are we going to do? Because they had set out this whole narrative uh, that they still needed several episodes to finish. So they're like, well, we can't just end it. This isn't Sarah Connor Chronicles. Uh, so what are we going to do? What's the solution? Well, yeah. Um, Uh, why was he able to be so candid, so open, 
in a magazine. This isn't a Zhou Jinxi anymore, right? This is 1983. Um, oh, also, by the time the article came out, actually the sponsor said, oh, yeah, um, yeah, sorry about that. So, um, yeah, do you want more episodes you can make? Or is it you want? Oh, we just killed the main character! <laughs> Okay, we're, we're two weeks. What are we gonna do? So then, um, Poppy, well, why the decision uh, to extend the common Well, Poppy said, uh, "Well, we got this other toy. <laughs> um, yeah. We can't. We, we can't bother to ask another uh, another production company to make another show about this uh, whatever the hell it is. <laughs> uh, crocodile thing. So, um, so put it in your show. If you put it in your show, you can continue the adventures of Mini Momo." Uh, so they're like, alright. Yeah. So there it is. It's there, I'm sure. And she's back. Um, it's not really reincarnated. I mean, it kind of is. Uh, you should watch it. Spoil the whole thing here. Um, but anyway, so this was not really an exceptional thing. And around this time period, lots of uh, you know divergences were starting to come up. Um, Space Boy Miyamoto cancelled. Revised the movie. Sequels. Major franchise. New movie in 2015. Uh, Mobsu Gun, cancelled, revised the movie, trilogy, sequels, major franchise, new series in 2015, and 16. Uh, Super Mansion Fortress Max, truncated, ended, major franchise, new series in 2016. Who's gonna watch it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> how? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> never, never mind that. Uh, very very sneaky um, The only reason that it didn't get a new series at around 2013, uh, when it would have done, um, is because unfortunately Shudo san died. Um, so, you know. Uh, I think people felt that it wasn't, it wasn't fair to revive her without him. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that these things, when they're truncated, uh, and then they're messed about with, and then they're extended again, uh, it actually gives them more momentum. Yeah? And Madras is no exception either. Uh, let's go back. So it was cancelled after 26 episodes. So 27 episodes, uh, that's because they had to put uh, an extra you know, time-wasting episode in between. Uh, <laughs> they, they said, uh, okay, well, so we'll have the climax now. Um, uh, the goodies win, <laughs> big surprise, and then they extended the show, and they're like, okay, well, what are we going to do? The Earth is destroyed, <laughs> guys, and so they said, all right, well, we'll pick up the story two years later, and now, you know, and Hikaru is still wondering whether he's in love with me now, and <laughs> yeah, obviously, they're you know, just stress, stressing me out. So, um, what's interesting is that what came after the real ending, the, this kind of uh, post aftermath arc thing uh, actually serves as the basis for everything that the sequels would be based on. So, yeah, it's extended as a franchise because of this extension. So, again, opportunistic restriction. We're telling you what to do, so work with it. And they did, and they really made, uh, made a really creative situation out of it. So, how does this situation arise? Well, I think that the catalyst is anime magazines. Again, something that uh, very few people talk about. So, um, you know, anime magazines didn't always exist. Anime has been around, anime on TV has been around since the early 1960s, of course, but magazines didn't really uh, talk about anime until much, much later. This is the kind of magazine you would have in the 1960s, and they would just be children's magazines or TV magazines for kids. Um, and, you know, they would have Kamen Rider or whatever. Uh, so maybe something in there sometimes. Um, but as I said, it's only when Yamato came along and not even when it came along, because when it was revived as a movie, that people actually started gathering, because they were old enough to, uh, making conventions and writing articles, and then basically getting their fanzines uh, made as proper publications. And that's really where uh, the anime magazine industry comes from. So they were always very, very candid, very, uh, uh, very, very, you know, we are writers, but you are one of us. You, the readers, you're fans as much as we are. Uh, and we want you to join us in a group. So it's like an early version of the internet. Um, so, yeah, I mean, stuff to use diagrams, photographs, writing, editing. All this is done by Yamato fans. Uh, Out is an interesting example because it wasn't originally uh, an anime magazine. It became one afterwards. It was originally a D movie magazine. It was also kind of like a subculture, weird magazine. Um, Surprise hit. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk about each of these magazines, but they had a lot. There was a big explosion uh, yeah, at, the, at the end of the 1970s, and we had magazines like Animedia, and The Anime, and My Anime, and you know, very original titles. Um, 
Um, and they all have their different niche. Um, here they are, I can talk in detail later on, but I don't have time now. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, they serve three purposes. World building, critique, and uh, the role of community. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about all of them right now, uh, but uh, community is the one that we're very interested in right now, because uh, for this particular generation, uh, you needed some kind of communicative system, almost like a proto-Twitter, right? And that's what these, uh, these magazines were. Their aim was mostly to establish and cultivate the link between the viewers, the readers, you know, and the fans, uh, and the editors and the production staff. Uh, because all those groups had similar interests. Remember DICOM, right? The people in the production staff were fans too, right? And they want to share this stuff. Uh, so it's a very, very cyclical relationship. <coughs> uh, until, until 1986, something happens. Um, <coughs> so, yeah. There was also an interesting magazine called Break Time. Uh, I've only ever found two copies in existence. Um, which was, uh, they called call themselves a gyokaihi, which is basically an industry um, magazine. And they had adverts for, like, staff wanted. Uh, we want you to, to paint cells if you can. There's this new, new movie coming out, Orion 2001, can you help? So, you know, uh, the, the door was always open um, for anime studios, uh, for people to come in. Yeah, and this is, uh, it's not very clear, this is a guy holding a portfolio. Uh, at the at the Genkan, the entrance of an anime studio, saying, "Excuse me, um, can I can I come in? I just want to show you my work." So in exactly the same way, the Kawamori and those people went over to Studio Nui and said, uh, "Hey, we love it. We love Yamato. Show us, show us some stuff." Uh, you know, they actively uh, reached out and said, "You can do this. Come over, uh, and we want you. We want because we, we know you're all very very talented. You've grown up the same way that we have with this stuff." Um, so this was the production system, or rather the the the, the flow to get your anime on air uh, at the time. You've got this production studio or a creative agency uh, teaming up with a sponsor, uh, and they had to go through an advertising agency to buy airtime. All right, classic style. Uh, no sponsor, no deal. Right. Sponsor equals merchandising, which means that uh, once Mickey Mo and Macros had aired, and all of the animators were like angry at their mistreatment. They said, all right, screw this. We're going to make our own uh, production system. Right. And uh, anyone know Megazone 2 3? Just a couple of hours, apparently, somebody, uh, maybe Crunchyroll, uh, announced that uh, it was going to be released on Blu ray in Japan. So I'm like very open to <laughs> It's the best selling OVA in existence. Really, seriously, trust me. <laughs> uh, anyway, so OVAs, right? That's what we're talking about here. Um, if you want your anime, you've got to sell your product. Anime has to be a product selling device. What does that mean? Well, you've got to sell your Valkyrie toy. Okay, fine. But after this, with the OVA market, the animation itself is the product. So now you can make a really great story, really great animation, and spend all your budget on that because you know you're getting it back through sales. And you know uh, that people want your product. I mean, Alexa 2 is basically, you know, Macros Hardcore, Macros on Steroids, right? Uh, you know, you want singing girls? Yes, you got it here. You want blood, guts, sex and violence? Yeah, you got it here. Transformers? Yeah, okay, fine. So, this is basically uh, the same thing. And you didn't need a sponsor because Victor, the distributor, was gonna foot the whole bill because they're the ones who are going to sell the product. It is the product. Uh, it is not a coincidence that lots of anime magazines crashed and burned at this time. Anime ended, the anime ended, my anime ended. Um, why? Well, that doesn't mean that every animation magazine uh, was, was gone. In fact, you got new ones. Anime V and Glow V. What was the difference here? Uh, let me just skip this. Um, well, let's take a look at what was happening uh, once OVAs came into the picture. Okay, 85, 86. Uh, immediately in 80, 86, giant robots, which were very, very popular up until 1985, you know, laser and double zeta, disappeared. The only thing you've got is double zeta and Machine Robo, and Transformers 2010, which, look, nobody watched, okay? <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's call the space thing. And 
in the OVA world, you've got Dan Kruger versions, you know, Dan Kruger video versions, which were based on TV. Uh, Leisner OVAs, which were based on TV. Votoms, based on TV. Magazine 23, part two, sequel to the previous year's magazine. Uh, this is not a coincidence with the decline of magazines. Also, new type appears at around this time. What is the difference between new type and all these new magazines and the previous magazines? Well, they are no longer uh, vessels through which you can communicate. These are now, and I'm not talking them, okay? These are now forums for the merchandisers to advertise their product. They are announcing their new wares to you uh, before the internet, right? So, they're basically closing the door, right? This was the breakout of plans until 86, and yeah. open the door, come on, come in! Uh, yeah. We are, I'm sorry, but we're closing off those avenues. You can't come in. We're working on something very, very top secret. You'll find out when it's time. In the meantime, we'll use these magazines to, you know, trickle down some information. So, if I'm sounding very cynical, I'm sorry, but uh, it, it really is the way it worked out. I mean, they have to protect their assets like that. Uh, and of course, uh, into the 90s, we get uh, you know, things like the production committee, which is completely different to the, uh, the we go to find the sponsor, we go to do this thing. Uh, now, everyone, you know, it doesn't matter how small a part of the role, you know, how small a role you play, uh, you, uh, you've got some chip-in style uh, investment things happening here. Uh, so, the production side and the user side is actually quite separate. You've got a cluster of small companies here, uh, a large one being the mega distributor, another one being uh, the outlet for information, which is the magazine, the editorial publishing PR. Um, in the middle, freelance writers, who used to enjoy talking about stuff as fans, right? But now they're like, okay, well, I'm not allowed to talk about this, I'm not allowed to talk about that. Uh, so they're stuck in a pretty hard place. And this is the scene right now. Actually, these, these magazines are a couple of years old. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, those magazines are still around, but they're not the same. Uh, the difference between TV and anime, uh, the difference between TV and OVA anime also was stark contrast, right? This is the same design, but one is a TV design and one is an anime, uh, one is an OVA design, right? So you can see that they're actually targeting different markets. So. We talked about, the, at the very, very beginning, we talked about the Year 24 group and how they formed a revolution and it permeated the mainstream and blah, 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 and now the manga industry is a major, major force. Yeah, okay, but that didn't really happen with OVAs because OVAs, by their nature, were targeted to a specific uh, group. And they basically left TV. They didn't want anything more to do with TV. Ever get it? a robot show? Was it made to sell robots? No! It was meant to sell all this junk! <laughs> <laughs> it's a chip-in style approach! Right? Uh, so, one producers, now, this is, you know, fast forward to right now, I'm sticking, skipping a lot, obviously, from time, which I don't know what to do. Um, producers now coming of age, uh, so taking advantage of the production committee uh, system to make sure the work is consistent throughout all aspects of media mix. So, now really is the period where we're starting to see maybe the seeds of a revolution where fans are at the management level and they are organizing the media mix at the very, very top. And, you know, it's a very, very tough logistical nightmare. Uh, and it's a, you know, a miracle that these shows are getting made. But, you know, this is the only reason why we can get shows like this. Yeah? This show... You're applauding that, right? Not me, I didn't make it. <laughs> this show could not have been made. 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. It just couldn't. There's, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's no production system in place for it to have existed. Yeah. What's, a ro what's a robot show? What's a magical girl show? Those boundaries are kind of meaningless now. We have robots, we have magical girls, only because they're templates, they're like traditions at this point. They're not records as they used to be. Uh, corporate collaborations are increasingly coming today. I've got a couple of stories about these if you don't hear them later on. Uh, and they do try to come back with, you know, behind-the-scenes kind of um, magazines. 
Um, but they never do well. I mean, they only last uh, a couple of issues. Sometimes uh, they have to, you know, package it with the product. In fact, this is funny because uh, the product is the main product here, the, the little Nendoroid that comes with this magazine. The magazine is the bonus. Uh, if, you go, if you want an online Amazon, you have to look on the toys, and then, oh, it comes with a 200-page magazine. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's, that's because, you know, uh, stores just won't carry it anymore. In these kind of magazines, there's, there's no outlet for it. Um, so, just to wrap up, it took about 15 years for animation to be recognized as a viable subject to base magazines on as consumers came of age. So, it's always, we're growing together with technology, we're growing up together with this medium, and we're becoming media literate. Um, but it's only uh, restricted to that particular generation, right? And the original generation of fans created the market for anime magazines from a grassroots movement. It's very important. It's always been all grassroots. Uh, you've now got a comic it's all, all people making their own stuff. Uh, publishers and editors at the time, you know, higher-ups, were of a different generation. So they, they don't understand. They don't have no knowledge. Okay. Uh, and uh, fans, viewers, readers, creators, creators, they all worked in tandem with one another. Uh, from as a critique of the art form. Macross was a culmination of this, as was Meiji Nomo, and then there were system uh, changes in the business. Uh, the role of anime magazines changed drastically. But now we have the internet, so I guess it's okay, right? Um, maybe. I mean, there's no, there's no official forum for this kind of exchange anymore. Uh, I think that's the really, This is a problem that's conducive to a stagnation of the uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into too much detail of this. Um, this kind of just leads into one final uh, conclusion point that I want to make, uh, which is that uh, the, uh, the Ministry of Culture in Japan is actually finally starting to look at the, uh, uh, the real creative aspects of these things, and they're putting together a, um, uh, a forum for discussion on this, and they're putting together papers and stuff. So you can check them out. Some of them will be translated into English. Uh, but yeah, I mean, some. Some publications still exist. Uh, I think that's it. We have time for zero questions. So thank you very much. <laughs>